Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our first class of our new series in the People's University. Uh, we're, we're talking about science tonight and for the next uh, six Thursday evenings, as a matter of fact. Uh, before we get to our guests today, just have a couple of things. First of all, our next Lunch with Books program on Tuesday will feature a musician named Carlos Trapp, uh, and he will take us through the history of black music in America, the roots of black music in America. So join us on noon this coming Tuesday, and we're doing that in honor of uh, Martin Luther King Day. Uh, and I wanted to let you know that if you ask a question this evening, I hope you can see that. It's a little dark in my office, but uh, it is a great women of science pint glass uh, that you can win. And all you have to do is ask a question. It doesn't even have to be a very good question. You can even just like the program, and I'll put you in the drawing to win the glass. Our first instructor in this brand new series is Mary Ellen Cassidy. Her professional background includes teaching and research, and I have Mr. Rooney here. I'm sorry. I'm going to put him down so I can do this. Uh, sorry. Teaching and research in the areas of chemistry, statistics, algebra, and environmental science. Her community background includes Appalachian Institute director. New Energy Economy Coordinator at WALS, the WALS Foundation, Wheeling Solar Co-op Coordinator, Solar United Neighbors of West Virginia Board Member, and Energy Efficient West Virginia Steering Committee Member. She is currently enjoying her work as a mathematics and science tutor at West Virginia Northern Community College's Academic Support Center. Here is Mary Ellen Cass. Thank you, Sean. I am going to take a minute here to put a PowerPoint up. And um, I use PowerPoints for several reasons. One of the major reasons is I want to remember what I wanted to say next. <laughs> and hopefully some of the graphics will be interesting to you also. So welcome and it's great to be with you tonight. Tonight we're going to explore the philosophy of science. The philosophy of science, like a lot of endeavors, has many avenues and facets. So we're going to narrow it down tonight to the definition um, given by Michaela Massimi, who is in the philosophy of science department at University of Edinburgh. She says, philosophy of science provides an important social function, making the public more aware of the importance of science. I see philosophers of science as public individuals who speak up for science and rectify common misconceptions or uninformed judgments. So that's us tonight. We're the public individuals who will speak up for science. We might start out by just saying, what is science? There's a lot of definitions, but they all have common themes. Britain's Science Council says, science is the pursuit of knowledge and understanding of the natural and social world following a systematic methodology based on evidence. That phrase is one of the phrases that you see uh, going through most people's definitions of science, a systematic methodology based on evidence. Berkeley University, and this is one of my favorite definitions also, Berkeley University says science is both a body of knowledge and a process. Science is a process of discovery that allows us to link isolated facts into coherent and comprehensive understandings of the natural world. I particularly like that definition because it combines, it's a body of knowledge and a process. The third remark there on science, I put that in there actually for, for Patty and Sean. So that's Bernard, uh, Bernard Shaw, Irish playwright, and that's his comment on science. He says, science is always wrong. It never solves a problem without creating 10 more. I think some people feel that way. So tonight we're going to focus on the science of why we reject science. And this particular cover and phrasing title there, I actually took from a Mother Jones article. And I thought it was very clever to, to phrase it that way, the science of why we reject science. So some people dismiss science because they feel like it's a a cold, aloof endeavor. Um, they know that science doesn't really care about them. Science doesn't care how we voted, what religion we profess, how much money we make. Science doesn't care if we can't emotionally deal with the uncertainty and the mutability of science. 
Science doesn't care about society's potential misdirected applications of its findings. Science doesn't care if we believe it or not. However, it is mildly amused by our anecdotal experiences. So one reason some people can't get into science is they feel like it's unrelatable. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll go through that tonight and see if we can change that idea. I was interested in looking in three areas of science denial. So either where it's formed or expressed. So we're gonna look at education, religion, and politics. So education, um, I always wonder when I think about science denial, how did those people arrive to where they are? Uh, what in their early years might have changed their view of what science is and how reliable it could be? And one of those things might be um, the way society sets up for us, who can do science? Um, for some reason, and I'll share a hypothesis of my own, but for some reason, um, scientists and society have been complicit in telling us that only the best and the brightest can do science, and that's not you. They also seem to reinforce the idea that there must take a special brain pattern or synaptic firings that, that allow scientists to be science. I can't tell you how many times in classes a student has come in, often before the course even starts, and says to me, you know, I could never do science or math. And then apparently it went back and afflicted generations in that family because often they'd also share, yeah, my mom and dad, they can't do science, my whole family. Not sure what that message is supposed to be, I can only guess. Society, I find, though, reinforces this, this idea that only special elite people can do science. So what would be the harm? My idea is the harm may be that it's saying to people at a very young age sometimes, you are not good enough for science. Science is for the other. And imprints upon them the idea that somehow they are different from science. They're not part of that world. And could possibly lead to feelings or develop attitudes or science that enables a science denial. Um, how we teach science wonder if we are actually enabling science deniers later in life by the way we teach science. Traditionally, when we teach science, we often don't do science or we don't do it often enough. We're teaching terms, formulas, um, a lot of fill in the blank, draw the diagram, label it. But I often wonder if we got the top students from all the schools in the area, and we said to them, here's your assignment. We would like you to propose a hypothesis that is testable and falsifiable. Then we would like you to design a controlled experiment. Make sure you take care of all the lurking and confounding variables. Then we would like you to tell us what equipment and instrumentation you would need. Record the data that you collect in a scientific way, noting uncertainty and precision. Analyze that data with the appropriate formula. So choose the right methods and, and math formulas for that particular investigation. After you analyzed the results of your data, report it in a conclusion that tells everyone the degree of uncertainty, the level of confidence, the margin of error. After you do that, we're going to exchange those scientific discoveries and we're going to let your schoolmate look at it and they will be the peer review. They will go through it and try to decide if they can find possible flaws in your methodology, in your reasoning. That would be an excellent, they would be doing science, right? I think most of our best students would still struggle with that assignment. And it's not because they're not bright, it's because they haven't the experience of doing science. They've had the experience of learning and memorizing and filling in numbers and putting them in a calculator. How does this connect with science denial? I want to posit, postulate the hypothesis that if this is your experience of science in early years in education, 
where you're simply memorizing, filling in blanks, doing cookbook labs. How could you possibly appreciate the rigors of science? And how could you possibly truly appreciate what science has to go through, what a scientist has to go through, the hoops they have to jump through just to arrive at a valid conclusion? So would our education in some way enable us to later in life dismiss science? It's irrelevant, it's obscure, it's for elite people. A lot of schools are changing and switching around their education to address this very issue. I'd also like to suggest that we work more on scientific literacy um, with the hopes that people can continue to learn. The whole point really of education is to teach people how to learn on their own, right? To empower them. Stronger scientific literacy. I can't help but think that would help in early years to develop the discernment of which articles you're reading and what reliability you want to assign to them. Too much too fast. This is the other thing that I think puts people off from science in education. If you're a science teacher, you receive uh, a list of objectives that under ideal situations, you will cover so well and so thoroughly, the student will master all of them. But if you look at the number, if you look at the time you have, if you look at the diverse skills that have come into that classroom, it at times feels really impossible. So could we slow down our learning? Could we take a breath? Could we investigate? Could we discover inquiry learning? We could, but it would take time. The other problem is the system itself pushes back against this. Your students will be assessed by standardized tests whether it's the American Chemical Society test, the SAT, the college boards. And those boards aren't gonna ask that student to dev devise an experiment and, and go through the steps I just said. They're going to ask for those quick, do you know, do you know, do you know questions. So I'm hoping that we're moving in the right direction. I know at colleges, a lot of the colleges aren't using SATs anymore. I personally still believe that we do need some national standardized test. It's just what that would incorporate is, is you know, going to be a challenge. But if we can in some way engender in our students how amazing science is, of course it relates to the natural world. The whole point of science was to investigate the wonders of the natural world. Somehow tell them you are a scientist. Um, I don't care what your IQ is. I don't care what your past is. I don't care what you're doing right now with your life. You're a scientist if you're interested in the natural world and you're interested in a method that will investigate and push you towards a better understanding, a valid conclusion of what and why things happen. So I would postulate, again, the idea that our education might in the early years predispose people to respecting and enjoying science, maybe, for some anyway, help them decide, if I read science, an article that's talking about a scientific finding, I have some comprehension of it now on a whole other level. Um, before we leave this, I just wanted you to note on the uh, cartoons on the slide uh, that science itself has its own kind of ranking. And everyone in science knows what the top level is, and that's physics. Now, you'll note in that little cartoon, I'm happy to see that chemistry next, and I'm not sure if you can read it because it's probably too small, but it says, um, the philosopher is out of frame to the far right. So philosophy of science didn't get a lot of credence in that instance. So if we could make science more about doing science, more discoverable, more relative to what goes on in the actual world, would more people have a positive and, and relatable view of science. How about religion? How does religion play into science denial, either in forming it or in expressing it? Um, I was teaching a chemistry class at one point, and there's a demonstration you do. And you pour a liquid from one beaker into an empty beaker, and when you pour it into the other beaker, it changes color, it turns pink. 
So we were doing an inquiry-based lesson and what was happening here. Now, they knew a little bit because at the time we were covering assets and bases. Um, as we did this a couple of times, some student in the back of the room said, wow, you, are you changing water to wine? And I said, oh, well, I didn't think of that, but yeah, yeah, maybe I am. And everyone kind of laughed and I said, maybe Jesus was a chemist. And I actually truly meant this as a expansion of Jesus's resume. I thought, you know, the historical Jesus, how cool would that be if he was a chemist? Well, next day I got some calls from parents who felt that I had not expanded Jesus's resume. I in fact had reduced it. So even in education, you want to be careful about what you're saying about religion and what you're saying about science. And you want to clarify to your students that really science doesn't have much to say about religion because science only can work with the empirical, real, physical world. It has no rulings or any tools that it can use, the supernatural or what, what some people might call the spiritual world. So what happens in science that makes it so appealing that, and so appealing to some, but not that appealing to others? What happens in religion that makes it so appealing and sometimes anti-science? Well, in religion, you have people on the top talking to you who you perceive as not only competent, but benevolent leaders. So often in other arenas, like in science, where you just get the hard truth, it doesn't matter if that message is benevolent or not, now you look at science and you find out that someone is looking after you, you belong, so there's an attraction there. Something else that religion can offer that science can't is certainty. Science doesn't go out to prove the truth of anything. It tells you that there's a high probability that at this point in time, with the knowledge we have, here are our results. Unlike science, uh, is, is not really geared towards certainty. It's, for, it's geared toward whatever the evidence gives you. Religion, though, can offer that certainty. Um, there's always an answer in religion, and that answer might be because it's God's will, or um, that's not for us to know. But even the answer that's not for us to know is given in a benevolent way. So that's where for some people, religion can be much more attractive than science. Now, coexist. Can religion and science coexist? Many people say no, and here's the reason. Science talks about the theory of evolution. If you are talking about, in religion, the theory of intelligent design, then you pretty much have negated much of the science that's in evolution that talks about the scramble of the genes and natural selection. Uh, science has never seen evidence of any entity stepping in design. So can those two things coexist? A lot of people would say no. How about science's uh, findings on transgender people? Uh, they find that you're born that way, right? Just like you're born with blonde hair or black hair, you're going to be tall or you're going to be short. And yet religion, some religions, tell us that transgender people shouldn't marry. There's something apparently not natural about it in their mind. Um, or you can marry, but not in the church. Or you can marry in the church, but you can't consecrate the marriage. So can science and religion coexist? At that point, they're contradicting each other. What about this? Here's what I think about sometimes when I think of science and religion coexisting. You know that beautiful gospel song, his eye is on the sparrow, and his is God, because in at least Judeo-Christian religions, God is a he, so his eye is on the sparrow. And in church, when you sing that song, there's a very comforting, comforting, consoling. Someone is watching over you and taking care of you. His eye is on the sparrow. So say you're a religious person, you come out of church, you go home, walk into your yard, and you see your cat. His eyes on the sparrow. You have to ask yourself, who's going to win this game? Is God going to protect that sparrow? The cat going to get him. And depending on that answer, and you might say, 
it depends. If you say that, you're already using the scientific method. So can science and religion coexist? In some arenas they can, in other arenas they clash and even cause a problem. How about science denial and politics? Um, let's look at a study and let me give you some of the background on this. Um, let's see. Um, okay. Article published in the Advances in Political Science and a complimentary one by the American Academy of Political and Social Science and another complimentary one, Pew Survey, complimentary meaning they seem to be telling us the same thing. They tell us this kind of information about science and politics. We tend to think that science deniers, if we could just give them the information, if they could just see what we see, read what we read on the scientific end, that then they would understand and accept what's going on with evolution or climate change or vaccines. And sometimes we think, well, if we got them all that information and they don't agree with us, they still don't see the scientific evidence, then maybe they just don't have good reasoning skills. These reports, these studies say, no, actually that's not true. That science deniers tend to be very well informed and reasoned political allegiances and free market ideology are what decides who is a science denier. And I'd like to read you just the phrasing of this from these studies. Neither knowledge nor rationality predicts the positions people take in scientific debates. Rather, it is their political allegiances, allegiances and especially support of free market ideology that are predictive. Interesting, several studies saying the same thing. Also interesting, in surveys they find that self-described conservatives, the higher the education, the more likely they are to be effective science deniers. Democrats and independents, the higher the education, the greater the tendency is for them to accept science. Interesting, you might be thinking a couple of reasons why that might be true. Also, some people say, well, you know, science now, it's like a war on science. I was reading an interesting article recently that said, actually, deniers don't have a war on science. They've created their own science. In some ways, they expect science so much that they've developed their own science, their own methodology. And, and in a, a true science perspective, we might see it as kind of a pseudoscience. But isn't it interesting that they desire very much to have their own science, not just straight out denial. Deference to experts. Um, one of the interesting things here too, I find, is that elitism plays into this. And remember when we talked about education and elitism? Elitism plays into which experts you defer to. If there's a perception that elites are giving stay-at-home orders, elites aren't actually that affected by them as much as working class individuals, then there can be a perspective of unfairness. And perceptions of unfairness are one of the biggest single drivers of anger. It turns out that if you are the expert and you're giving this result of your findings and you give those results without any concession to I know this is going to hit some people. I know it's going to hit their businesses, um, affect their income. So as a scientist, I don't have that particular skill. I'm not in that arena, but I would like to work with anyone that would be willing to work with science and figure out what would be the best way to address this, not only scientifically, but using the science of economics to put this together. So give some acknowledgement that the, the information you're giving um, may sound very elitist, depending on the way the message is delivered. And it goes on to say that people will get angry now with this perception of unfairness of the message you're relaying to them. It's very natural to fall into an angry state because fear is so aversive experientially. So I know a lot of people say, oh no, love is, is the most driving force in emotion. Many studies have said no fear is the strongest in driving emotion. 
If I can be mad at somebody or mad at something, it feels like I have a little bit of control at least. Anger also promotes a feeling of certainty and energizes people. I thought about this, I'm angry about it now, I'm lashing out. There's a feeling of control, a feeling of empowerment. Acting out anger actually fuels anger. Isn't that interesting? Didn't you always think, well, you know, let them just get it all out, they'll calm down, we'll talk. But it actually fuels more angle, anger, whether it's outright or insidious. So scientists and politics, it's not as simple as we think. It's not as simple as just if we could only get them to look at the facts and reason. Um, in fact, many science deniers are well-informed, very well-reasoned, and have their own experts. Science and politics go back to com competent and benevolent. Conservatives do not defer to many scientists because they see them as competent, but not benevolent. Think back to that free market ideology threat. Liberals defer to most competent institutions and individuals. Again, they are more into the, I'd say, regulated capitalism view versus the complete free market. So if the findings are benevolent to them, of course, that would be easier to accept. Both have high sensitivity to testifiers. So in other words, if the person delivering the information is on your side, in your tribe, in your group, it will be so much more quickly assimilated. Something we kind of know, but it's interesting that studies actually show that. Tribalism. Um, I want to just jump to the third part there. Tribalism, a choice, who they are and what science knows. So many studies say the same kind of thing about tribalism and trying to convince or talk to a science denier. If the identity that people share in their group becomes entangled with some position, and that position is that issue in science, then you're making them choose between who they are and knowing what science knows. And if you put to them that choice, then people are going to always resolve in favor of being consistent with their tribe, with their identity. And it goes on to express that, that strong need for the tribalism, it, you know, going back to evolution. Um, you stayed with your tribe, you didn't go out alone. You identified the threatening tribes as others and that, that that's you know, very deep and deeply ingrained in the human species. So if you're talking to someone, you want to try to reach some kind of agreement on a scientific issue, uh, it's best not to frame it in terms of you're a conservative, you're a Republican, you're a Democrat, but instead in terms of what do you think? Where did, where did it all start? Where did you first learn about this? What does neuroscience say about politics and science? Studies from, let me get you the source of this here, articles uh, published in Scientific American, studies by Van Bevel and P Pieria um, at New York University in Trends of Cognitive Sciences. Um, here's what they're telling us. They're telling us conservatives desire security, predictability, and authority more than liberals do. Liberals are more comfortable with novelty, nuance, and complexity. And again, if you're thinking like I'm thinking, you want to go back and read that article to get more details on that, right? Some more interesting information, neuroscience-wise. Gray matter making up the anterior cingulate cortex tends to be larger in liberals. This is the area of the brain that detects errors and resolves conflicts. Liberals are more attentive to incongruent information. The insula and anterior cingulate cortex are activated. So when, when um, people are presented with information that is contradictory or doesn't make sense, um, liberals are more attentive. They'll spend more time of it and those part of their brains will light up. The amygdala is larger in conservatives. That's the area that helps regulate emotions and evaluates threats. Isn't that interesting? Larger amygdala is associated with a lower likelihood to participate in a protest. Larger volume amygdala are also associated with that alert item, be alert to potential threats. So it's interesting that in the studies, this larger amygdala idea and the idea of being on guard uh, for threats 
uh, and, and see if you think that fits in with, with your worldview of scientists and science deniers. Um, basically, it comes back to, on those terms there, cognitive dissonance, motivated reasoning, confirmation bias, system justifiers, I feel could be all wrapped up into one phrase. Um, good people don't do bad things. So how do you resolve two simultaneous thoughts in your head that they're contradictory? In other words, no, I don't want environmental refugees to have to leave their home with their children and live in these refugee camps where sometimes there's not enough food they're taken advantage of. No, I don't want that. I'm a good person. Let's see. So that would entail my speaking up for a new energy system to stop putting all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, causing climate change. That's going to be tough because my family works for the fossil fuel industry. We are also good people. So there's a dissonance. There's a, a, a two thoughts that seem to be contradictory you've got in your mind. You can resolve it in a number of ways. You can just learn more on each end and find out that is there a way where they do come together? Or you can simply stay in denial and do what is called motivated reasoning. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm going to be motivated to look for articles that say in fact, climate change isn't caused by humans. Um, climate change has nothing to do with the threat of the refugees, a motivated reasoner. So I've got a, a look of, of um, research here that will confirm my bias, confirm what I need to have to know to believe that I am a good person. And another way they'll phrase this is you're a system justifier. So what, um, what I think we have to face, and this is, this is hard when I read it for me to accept it first. The more and more they looked at the denial of science, they said, now you can spin it any way you want, but here's what it comes down to. It comes down to acknowledging unsettling moral differences. Denialism is not a barrier to acknowledging a common moral foundation. Denialism is a barrier to acknowledging moral differences. To admit we want different things. Our moral systems are different. We're not going to reach completely into a common ground because we don't have a common moral ground. Still not sure I'm convinced of that. But the more I read, the more it makes sense. The, the comment in the same article, and let me get you that article. Um, so this is from an article by Keith Hahn Harris in American Psychological Society. And it talks about this. Perhaps if we can face up to the challenge presented by these new revelations, it might pave the way for a discussion shorn of illusion and moral masquerade where different visions of what it is to be human can openly contend. This might be a firmer foundation on which to rekindle some hope for human progress, based not on illusions of what we would like it to be, but on accounting of who we are and what we are, moral differences. Possible solutions suggested. When you're talking with someone who is a science denier, we're at opposition, you're at opposition with each other's thoughts. The advice is don't lead with the facts, lead with values. So tell that person or ask that person, why do you think the way you do? I wanna learn more about what you value and how you prioritize things. The idea is to start a conversation with listening instead of keying up your argument to defend your side. Talks a lot, the articles talk a lot about empathy and it's not the empathy I think that we usually think of. Um, and here's how I phrase the empathy solution. If you're thinking about what went on recently in DC, storming of the Capitol, and then someone asked me to have empathy with the stormers, I don't think that's gonna happen right away anyway. So I don't look at empathy from that view, although I need to learn more there. I look at empathy from this view. There's some little girl, some little boy in Wayne County, West Virginia, or Chicago, Illinois, right now, who feels like they don't belong to anyone. They're not valued by anyone. No one hears them. No one sees them. 
that I can have empathy with. Is that some of the explanation for the roots where this, what I would call sometimes vicious denial comes from? Almost every article I read on solutions came back to that point, the need for belonging. Um, there was a woman that spoke on um, the news lately and she talked about, she worked at, um, uh, can't think of it, DC, I'll have to look at it, I'm sorry. One of the universities in DC, American University. And they have a, a um, department there for polymerization, polarization, extremes. This woman that spoke was previously a white supremacist. And she said that the one thing that took her over to that side was that a family came to her, invited her in, and she felt that for the first time she belonged somewhere and to someone. She felt for the first time that someone heard her and acknowledged her and knew she existed. I know that sounds a little sappy, but the science of the denial of science is telling us that plays a big part in how people come to be so strongly aligned with the other side. Storytelling, if you're talking to someone, talk in terms of stories, not exchange of statistics and facts. I mean, those are important and hopefully you'll get there, but don't leave with that. Um, an example they used there, which I really liked was, they said, when you're talking to someone about what you would like to see happen, um, don't give all the bad things that you think they did and blocking it, but instead give them a picture and an imagery of what it could be, how, could it, how good it could be for everyone. And the example they give is that, for instance, Martin Luther King Jr., when he gave what might be one of the best speeches and most inspiring speeches of all time, the speech was, I have a dream. The speech wasn't, I have a nightmare. Although he would have had every right to give that speech. So paint for someone the picture of what it could be like where everyone gets ahead. And finally, none of this will matter if we can't improve living conditions. So who are people that are uh, denying um, uh, we should be wearing masks or not? Um, is in fact it necessary for everything to be shut down? I deny the science of that social distancing stuff. Some of that may come again for just the resentment of everything they've ever owned is now going down the drain and be taken away from them. How do you convince someone to think about science, whether it says about medicine or um, the stability of buildings, how you use your energy systems? You're trying to sell them on the idea of a zero energy building, which is completely possible scientifically, but they can't relate to that. They can barely have the house they have now. So if we're going to get people to think about science on a higher level, you have to address the needs they have right now. What are their living conditions? That plays heavily. That and the need for belonging are the things that kept coming up for how do we prevent people to getting so, what I would say, viciously um, argumentative about science. These are just some articles I would recommend because they've been in the news lately. Pharmaceutical supplements. There's some great articles on um, Prevagen and Golo. And um, spoiler alert, uh, there's no scientific, very little scientific evidence behind them that isn't uh, company funded. So you might want to look that up. Prevagen, there's a good article from the Harvard Health blog. And Golo, there's an article um, by um, Coffee in the um, US News World Report. You might wanna look into that. Coronavirus is a black swan. Um, it turns out that we should have seen this coming. Uh, the coronavirus was not really unpredictable. In fact, apparently it was in a lot of uh, books and media, it was even in TED Talks. Um, Bush and Obama talked to NIH about it, the, the exact type of thing we're going through now and how to prepare for it. There were tabletop simulations and all that was put aside. There was even a um, exercise called Crimson Contagion. And it talked about the possibility of 600,000 people being affected by um, a pandemic. So the question here is, what, how important is science? Science is so important that it could be the death of 
many, many hundreds and thousands of people, millions of people possibly, if we don't listen to what it's telling us and how to prevent it, how to deal with it. That goes right into climate change. The same thing holds. Um, science, if you want to convince someone that it's important, uh, I think this latest run on with climate change, extreme weather events, the pandemic, hopefully that will convince them it's worth looking into and, and listening to. How do you deal with a denier? Again, lead with values, not the facts. Listen to them. Where are they coming from? And do some things within our own system, maybe our education system, maybe in our religious system that would not engender this um, denial and dismissal of science. Uh, last thing I'd like to say is if you would also be interested in the politics of science, there's an article uh, in the Washington Post, it's in a lot of the publications actually, about two scientists that worked for the um, White House Office of Science and Technology. And they published what are called the climate flyers or the, yeah, the climate change flyers. They're science deniers and they actually published these flyers and they put the logo of the White House on it and published them in a, um, on a blog, a like individual blog, but they published them as if they were official government publications. So go to the Washington Post, that's where looking up. Uh, they actually have a link to those letters and you'll be amazed if you've been following climate science at all. They raise up what I call, I don't call it, I, I got that from uh, another article, these zombie facts, all of these dragging out, all of these facts, so-called facts that have been discredited over and over, but they just don't seem to die. And so here's people um, in the White House at the Office of Science and Technology putting out this kind of information as if it were coming straight from our government. All of those are worth looking at. Um, and I'm taking up too much time because I could talk forever about science in the media and science in the news. So um, what I would like to do now is ask you, what are some of your thoughts about science denial? Have you talked with people and been success successful in reaching any common ground? What do you think about the science that says science denial is because we have different moral values, not necessarily because we can't reach a common moral value? Um, have you had an experience where religion impacted how you felt about science? How about your education? So I'd like to turn it over and, and see what you think, hear your comments and, and thoughts on any of this. Um, and, and thank you. Thank you for listening. see. Ah, good comment. Seems to me your initial definition of science would apply to any academic discipline. 100% agree. Um, I would say any academic uh, discipline that studies the natural empirical world. Um, and that's what I think differentiates science from, um, let's say, religion. So Religion can also use a very methodical, systematic principle, but it's not examining or using the rules that science has for the empirical world. But very good point. Yeah, you don't have to be in science to be using the scientific method. Math and language arts take precedent over other subjects like science. Language and lack of arts take precedence. Huh, I'm interested because it says math and language arts. Um, my experience has been that language arts actually do take precedence, but you know what? That might be a bias. That might be because I value math and science so much that I'm seeing it that way. I've never read studies or, or documented it, but it's important. It's an important thought because it's telling, it's telling our younger people what we value most. Uh, and I don't know the answer. I've not read information on that, but I'd like to learn more. That's an important thought. Oh, thank you. <laughs> One of our presenters has, has agreed with me that Jesus was definitely a chemist. Yes. <laughs> I mean, think of all the people, all the students we could bring in if we could convince them that, um, that Jesus had a, a love and reverence for science. And I think 
you know, the historical Jesus, there might, there might be some things we could look at there. I'm a theologian, and I think science and religion have a lot to say to each other. So did John Henry Newman in his idea of a university. And I, I do know that, and I'm not a scholar in religion, but I do know that people are very high prestige in science and people very well respected in religion all the time say, yes, of course, there's a meeting where we can both lift up humanity. Um, I think the people that say it can't coexist are simply coming from the very technicality point, technical points of um, if you're someone who believes in intelligent design, then by virtue of that belief, you're denying what evolution teaches in natural selection. So I think they're getting down to core details like that. But I, I absolutely do know that much. I'm not a specialist in religion, but I knew that I do know that people in those areas um, of high esteem have said, of course, they come together and together can lift up mankind. Thank you for that. Let's see here. Science without religion is lame. I love this. Science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. Einstein. Well, there you have it. I, I am not going to argue with Einstein. <laughs> Thank you, Hope. That, that, was a, that was a great comment. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see, do you think people think that their income status has something to do with lack of confidence in studying science? I do. For example, someone with low income may think that studying science is expensive as specialized equipment is needed and therefore don't pursue it. Oh, I absolutely do think that your income, your economic and social status have uh, a lot to do with how you perceive science. Um, just an anecdotal, you know, not a study, but just an anecdotal uh, story there. When I was in high school, um, I studied like crazy because it, it had been made clear to me that if I wanted to get out of where I was and move further, it all depended on education. Um, in high school, I started to realize that I loved science and math, but I probably wasn't gonna go into those fields because I didn't have the money to go to college. And it's hard, not impossible now with the great technical programs, but at that time it was difficult uh, to major in science or math, love it in high school, and then to not have a college degree, there wasn't too much to do with it. I luckily, speaking of religion and science coming together, I luckily had a principal of the school at that time, Sister Ann Regina, and she was a sister from the Congregation of St. Joseph, and she took me out of class one day and she said, I thought you were interested in science, but you've signed up for the business course, which is also valuable. It just depends on where your desires and hopes and skills are. And I said, yes, I did, because um, there's no way I'm going to college. Um, my mom and dad didn't go to college. We don't have the money to go to college. Um, I should probably get a job and you know help support them. And she said, what if I could look into scholarships um, you know, with your grades and background and and get you a scholarship to college, what would you think then? I mean, for the rest of the day, I couldn't function. I was so excited. But unless she had stepped in at that moment, I don't know if I would have gone into science and math because it's expensive to go to college. The books and um, the, the resources you have to have sometimes are off the charts. So absolutely. Um, and, and that gives me a chance to talk about our next session where Darlene Stradwick will talk about our HISTA program that addresses that kind of thing. What if you love math and science, but you don't have the money to buy books about it or, or resources to learn more or to kind of do a little testing on your own? Um, absolutely, it has an impact. Yeah, thank you for that question. What advice would you give scientists about how to make the results more relatable? Oh, that's so important, isn't it? And here's my belief, and just, just ding me on this. I may be way out there, but I think that it's not just science alone. I think that somehow we kill the curiosity of kids, and I'm talking about myself as a teacher. <laughs> Sometimes in education, we kill the curiosity of a child because, again, we have so many objectives that we've got to get through. And so instead of like saying to them, what are you interested in? Uh, it might not be on our list. It might not be one of the objectives. What are you interested in? What would you like to learn more about? 
There was a gentleman years ago who said, I've never met a five-year-old who wasn't curious and intelligent. And yet I rarely meet an 18 year old that is curious and intelligent. What comes in between the American education system? And I say that being a teacher. And I think we have to look at this whole system where we're not developing a curiosity. So should scientists in some way be able to make their work relatable? Absolutely. But I'm, I'm going for a higher level. Wouldn't it be cool if just like just about everything was fascinating to you? How is that not true? How do you look at the natural world and not find it fascinating? How do you come across a scientific study and not say that's remarkable? So I, don't, I think that, that making it more relatable is more relatable to your everyday life. And let's step back to the social and economic problems too. Um, yeah, that's great for me to promote promote curiosity and isn't everything, don't you want to learn more? But, you know, if you're just about making it through the day, day and you don't know where your next meeting meal's coming from and your parents are working two jobs, um, that's a hard sell. So I think that's a really important question. I don't have the answer, but I do know we have to figure out a way to engender curiosity and a love of learning, uh, no matter what the, the students exercise. And then when they grow up, I think it's more likely that they will find just about everything relatable because it's about the world they live in. Um, and I'm really curious, our next session, I'm really curious to hear uh, the other speakers and their answer to that. I obviously don't have a good answer to that. Again, really important question. It seems today people just argue. There is very little discussion. I stay silent because if I say anything back, I'm just adding a lot to the fire. I hear you, that's out of control. Do you think we can come together and really discuss anything? Um, you know what, I, the more I was reading about this, about empathy, you know, and, and how to relate to someone who doesn't think the way you think and how you start with the questions, I would recommend there's an article on something that's called, I had it on the slide, but didn't really address it much. It's a technique called deep canvassing. And it started with the idea of people who would go door to door and try to get people to sign up for whatever they wanted. And they learned certain techniques on how to talk to people. It pretty much goes back to that old saying, um, talk like you're right, listen like you're wrong. And don't listen to just think of what you're gonna say next, but listen to what they're really saying. And maybe just as important, listen to what they're not saying. Um, I really was fascinated in the study that said, people react and they stop listening when they feel they're threatened, um, that their social status or their economic status is threatened. So I think when we talk to each other, we have to talk on terms of, where are you coming from? When did you first feel like that? It's a whole science in itself. I do worry about the discussions that go on where everyone's just waiting to say the next thing to talk the next thing that the last person said and, and you get nowhere. Um, I have had, and I, I would like to hear from you personally too. I have had discussions where we've talked to each other. We've not left agreeing on a whole lot but we've reached some common ground. Um, there's also a, a technique that talks about, oh, tell myself not to talk so much. <laughs> there's also a technique that, that talks about how to listen and even your body language when you're listening. And you would hope that these things were normal, right? That you would just human to human be able to converse this way. But I think the stage we're at in society, it's almost like we'll have to learn that technique and observe others who do it well and kind of say to yourself, wow, how did they get that person to really talk to them? How did they get that person to get to the heart of what we're talking about? And uh, ask them for tips on that. It's, it's a fascinating study. We could probably do a whole series on that alone. How do we talk to each other? You know, actually have demonstrations and examples. And I think it would be really helpful. And maybe I was going to say, maybe Sean would set up a series like that. And Sean's like, stay in your lane, Cassidy. I'll do the programming. But uh, yeah, that's a, that's a whole study. And I am reading more and more. When I looked at science denial, 
I started reading more and more about how do we talk to each other? Why do you think it is that the layperson accepts the contrarian science rather than the majority data? You know, I think because they're looking for something that's comforting. I think it's confirmation bias. Um, who wants to hear the real science? And I include myself in that sometime. When that book came out, The Uninhabitable Earth, um, I felt very well documented in studies like it. I mean, I accepted it because it was irrefutable in my mind, but I could understand why people wouldn't. Wouldn't I rather hear that we are going to come up with the technology pretty soon that we won't have to change anything. It will just kind of take care of all this um, climate change, um, reverse sources of pollution, some magical thinking. I totally see the appeal of that. I think people believe contrarian science because it's comforting and it tells them you're not bad people. If you do these things and now we're finding by science that this causes trouble, good people don't do bad things, right? So I'm gonna to listen to the contrarian, I'm gonna sign up with them because they affirm what I think about life. They affirm uh, the free market ideology, the idea that corporations are gonna employ us all and save us and trickle down economy. Um, I protect my social status and my economic status. So contrarian feeds right into what I need to hear. And I guess I, I am shocked when I keep reading that it's not knowledge or rational thinking. It's not well, how well informed or how your um, thinking skills, analytical thinking are. That's not what decides if you listen to contrarians. It's the need to have your social, economic, and sometimes your religious beliefs affirmed. And so it's comforting. Uh, that's my take on it anyway, from what I've read so far. I miss the lectures at Wallace. It's great seeing and hearing you speak. I know, I miss them too. I can't wait till we're all together again. And, and of course, um, that, that will come. That will come. Uh, I miss them too. I miss just, I don't even just miss the lectures. I miss the in-betweens where we get to talk to each other and share ideas. And um, it's, it's uh, yeah, I do. I miss it too. I hope we get physically together soon. Another significant area of science to know is when industry and science conflict and science is destroyed for personal and financial interest. Yeah, and there's, I mean, what do you do when someone's pouring millions and millions of dollars um, into media and billboards and radio and TV telling you, uh, listen, here's the real story. Um, you know, the great book, Merchant of Doubt, right? Um, the other one, The Death of Expertise. Those are all good. Uh, and I will say this. I will say that I would always tell my students, you know, if it's corporate funded, um, it's probably not the one reliable source you want to go with. You want to get some more information. But I will say that sometimes uh, you do have a corporation funded doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong, uh, but it certainly is uh, something to look at. So there's a whole list of how you know reliable sources. And often they'll say, look for who funded that source. And it doesn't necessarily invalidate it, but it's important. Um, I can think of, and it's funny because when I saw Hope, I was thinking of some of the work we did together at Jesuit. And I can think of instances where um, the corporate entities made very good contrarian arguments uh, and they were very comforting to the people who worked for them. So yeah, that's, that's tough. I, the funding is hard to overcome. You want to think that just good, good thoughts and good science will get through, but when you're fighting multi dot multi-billion dollar, you know, worldwide industries, you got to keep working at it, right? Chipping away. Yeah. Oh, I see Sean's back. Yeah, I'm here. And I'm, I'm sorry that it's so dark. I'm going to try to put a light on, but uh, thank you very much. I'm going to let you off the hook now because you've done an excellent job. And, um, uh, Thank you. I wanted to show you this because uh, Teresa says she hopes we'll still go live when we go back to in person. 
And I think that's something we have to consider. Uh, the, if there's one benefit to this uh, tragedy, the pandemic, it is that we've learned how to do things differently. And I think we've been able to reach people all over the place that we weren't able to reach before. So I think that is a side benefit and something we have to consider going forward. So I just wanted to say that. Um, oh, wow. Here's another question about flat earth. <laughs> I'll let you handle that, and then we oh, are last. That reminds me of something I wanted to throw in here anyway. It's just a quick little comment, but um, it may not be directly related to flat Earth, but um, it's a comment um, of Anthony Fauci about people having so much trouble with the coronavirus. And if I can't find it quickly, I'll just give up. Um, well, we can post it afterwards. We'll post it afterwards, but essentially he's saying that that kind of, yeah, that kind of contrarian, I'm with you. I mean, come on, right? <laughs> so he's saying that what he's realizing, what I'm realizing is that this is a poke in the eye of the other side and the experts. Um, and, and to me, the flat earther is the ultimate poke in the eye. I mean, I can see, you know, no, I can't say. I'm going to try and I'm going to try to learn more and talk more. But it, it relates to, I think, what Dr. Fauci was saying is sometimes the disbelief or the denial is simply a poke in the eye at the people who they see are trying to take authority over our system. And yeah. they've got to fight back. And that, to the extent where they'll sign up with, you know, something that um remarkable in that first way yeah, yeah. okay uh, and i'll reserve comment as well <laughs> but i do want you to read this because it's very nice oh great that's the best thing ever isn't it, isn't it great? that's the best thing ever when you're talking and, and you're watching something with your kids and things come up and you learn so much about them and so much you've taken for granted that you thought that they knew or thought about. That's that's great to hear. I agree. Uh, so, hey, let's give something away. Oh, yeah. I have the all the names here. Well, Sean, while you're shaking that, just a quick promo again for the next yeah. session. Yeah. Um, we have the real experts coming on, and it's going to be a very interesting discussion. Um, they have a lot of the answers, I think, that I didn't. So please, please tune in. Well, I mean, they have other answers, but I thought you did an excellent job. And, and one at least one of our experts was here tonight and agrees with me, I think. That is Maybe that related. Was very kind. That was very kind. Not that she's. So let's see who the winner is. But here we, we go. Ready? A, we should do a statistical analysis right before you pull this. No, yeah. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, here we go. I'm going to do it. Everyone trusts me, right? I'm very trustable. Trustworthy. Are word. you competent and benevolent, Sean? I am benevolent. I will say yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, here's our winner. Ready? <laughs> okay, let me explain. <laughs> Normally, I would say this is disqualified because it's someone related to me, but I thought it's only fair, you know, since we're doing science and I'm so trustworthy that we let even my own mother. Who is the winner tonight? Oh, Marianne Duffy, you just won the uh, Great Women of Science pint glass. Ah, that's great. Congratulations. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank let's you. see. There's another comment here. <laughs> Kicking science butt. Oh, Ray. that's my uh, Daniel Metz. That's my nephew who I love. Thank you. Miss you. Some people are questioning my benevolence. They are uh, discredited for that reason. <laughs> Here's another one, Pat Jacobson. Oh, my golly, Pat, how are you doing? I think there's Maria. That's a great comment, and I agree with that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks to your work, too, Patricia. Pat, I mean, Pat had so much to do with connecting us all up with the people for the solar, and uh, I can't say enough about Pat Jacobson, a uh, most remarkable person. I'm sorry we lost her to Virginia. but And that is unfortunate, yeah. Yeah. But uh, at least she's still out there working hard for 
the good things. I have no doubt. Yeah. yeah. Like Mary Ellen said, next week we will have a panel discussion with all of our instructors and our guest, Darlene uh, Stradwick. And we'll talk about all these subjects again and get different perspectives and different input. And uh, we invite you to be there. Thanks, everyone, for attending. See Thank you next week. Congratulations, Mom. <laughs>